well, uh, give a brief introduction. Yeah. So, so today we, I mean, thanks everyone for attending this uh, Frontier Condensed Metaphysics seminar. So, so today we're actually extremely happy to have uh, Colin Broholm from Johns Hopkins. And Colin is, and I are a good friend for, for many, many years. And, and Colin, uh, you know, is, is a wonderful uh, uh, neutron scattering scientist and, and has actually spearheaded the many exciting projects, you know, in building a new instrument at the uh, NIST. And he, for example, uh, built the, the original spins and then also constructed the, the max, which is- uh, Can you guys hear me? Sorry? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So which is really- right. a, you know, which is really a wonderful machine that that uh, you know make many many you know important progress, and Colin is also extremely well known in in doing uh, you know frustrated you know magnetic materials, and uh, he has uh, done many many wonderful work in this area. So uh, recently he he had uh, worked on this uh, cative compound or, or so called cative compound initially thought to be cative compound, and, and today I, I invited the, you know Colin to give this talk and to really tell us. Uh, and what his take in terms of uh, uh, magnetic interactions on, on this particular compound and burn cobalt arsenic oxygen. Yeah, thank you, Colin. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I really uh, am excited to be able to speak in this uh, seminar series. Um, and uh, today I am going to talk about uh, barium cobalt arsenic oxide. And this is a compound that uh, was brought to my attention by uh, Bob Carver and Rudong Zong. Um, and uh, that we worked on at the Institute for Quantum Matter, both using neutron scattering and uh, terahertz spectroscopy. Um, and it's been quite a voyage. We thought initially that this was going to be a Kitaev type uh, uh, spin liquid candidate. Um, but in the collaboration that involved uh, Yangbei Kim's group, we found that actually uh, it is dominated by competing near and next end neighbor interactions. So it essentially is like a easy plane ferromagnet uh, with a competing antiferromagnetic interactions uh, to the third nearest neighbor. Um, so that, that's the kind of outline of it and uh, what I'd like to uh, try to describe in this talk. Uh, so as we come along, please interrupt uh, with your questions um, and uh, because then we'll be able to make sure that we're on the same page. And we have, uh, it, I've noticed that you've reserved quite a big slot of time, so we should be able to get uh, through it at a, at, a, at a kind of natural pace and not at the hyper speed that we sometimes have to do. Uh, so this is the group of uh, people who have been working this on this uh, project. And I'd like to mention in particular uh, Tom Halloran, who is a graduate student. He's now at University of Maryland. And this was one of his major uh, projects during his PhD thesis. Uh, he just graduated uh, just um, several, uh, I guess, half a year ago. Uh, then we have uh, Bob Kava and Ridong Zong, uh, who prepared and did the initial uh, sort of modern presentation of this material. The material has been in the news, uh, in, in the literature before them, but they really brought it into the context of frustrated, um, potentially Kitaev magnetism. And then very important in this work was uh, the... Um, neutron scattering experiments uh, that were carried out, out at the NIST Center for ne Neutron Research and at the Spallation Neutron Source. And for that work, we were uh, uh, fortunate to be able to collaborate with instrument scientists at Ogres National Lab, uh, Lab Barry Wynn, Melissa Graves, and Guibo Kao. And uh, Zihun Tzu uh, worked on this compound also at the NIST Center for Neutron Research. And his, his work is, it was also an important part of this. Uh, from the University of Toronto, we collaborated with Yongbei Kim and his group, Felix de, uh, de Rocher, Emily Zhang, and Lee Aaron. Uh, and that was really a very exciting uh, collaboration that allowed us to make progress in terms of understanding the spin Hamiltonian for the material. But I think this kind of work, it really needs, uh, you know, the, the strong interaction with theorists uh, to be able to make, um, uh, to make the kind of progress that I hope to convince you that we've made in this, uh, in, in the project. And so these are the two papers that uh, I'll be describing. Um, I'll mostly be talking about the first paper, which uh, focuses focuses on obtaining the uh, the spin Hamiltonian uh, for the material. Uh, but I'll also show you some data from this uh, nice paper that uses terahertz spectroscopy to probe the magnetic excitations. Uh, so this is a project in the in the kind of ongoing quest uh, to discover a quantum spin liquid. Uh, my talk will be pretty much focused on the barium cobalt arsenide compound, but I just want to bring people uh, into the framework of, of this uh, long-standing effort to find this new state of matter. 
Uh, and it's really, you know, been going on, I guess now this, this timeline covers more than 70 years. And uh, I'm starting off by mentioning the Linus Pauling's uh, RBB theory of metals. And this was where the concept of a resonating valence bond, I think, first appeared in the literature. Uh, but Phil Anderson uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in the 70s uh, uh, proposed the idea of having a uh, resonating valence bond of singlets uh, involving spin degrees of freedom that were interacting antiferromagnetically, but not forming an antiferromagnetic static state, but actually a, a continuously uh, fluctuating or a quantum superposition of singlet covering, uh, coverings of, of a lattice, in this case, a triangular lattice. There's a be really beautiful and very uh, influential paper that opened um, the, you know, the scientist's uh, mind and curiosity towards the possibility of having this really qualitatively different kind of state of matter, which would be defined by, uh, by entanglement rather than some static ordered state uh, on, on the lattice. Uh, but then it was with the discovery of high temperature superconductivity uh, that Phil Anderson then uh, essentially postulated uh, uh, that, um, that the underlying, the basis for the high temperature superconducting state was this uh, spin liquid, and that it was upon uh, doping, um, so moving away from half filling of a, of a corner spin liquid that one could have the development of a uh, of this kind of high temperature superconducting state. And that really opened uh, you know, the floodgates of interest of, uh, to try to realize, first of all, in an insulating material, the quantum spin liquid phase. Um, and it, it sort of coupled to an ongoing interest in frustrated magnetism that was developing at the time, uh, but really kind of, um, I think, uh, directed this, this effort towards identifying the quantum spin liquid. Uh, and uh, then it's been essentially a, uh, a, a kind of a dual effort of, of developing models that might be able to realize a spin liquid uh, and having an analytical understanding of the spin liquid and then developing materials that actually could realize the, uh, these kinds of um, states of matter. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the models that people have been interested in for a long time as well as the Kagame lattice, which is uh, kind of a, a diluted version of the triangular lattice, again, a 2D, uh, model of magnetism, and uh, much effort went into trying to find materials that realize this uh, this structure. And this is a whole topic on its own. Uh, but uh, uh, young Lee and Dan Nocera discovered uh, the Herbert Smith -like compound, which actually has uh, this um, uh, this uh, Kagame lattice structure, and, and did uh, a number of experiments on those materials, including some neutron experiments that I was uh, collaborated with him on. Uh, where we actually found something like a continuum of excitations with neutrons that, that is one of the indicators of, uh, of fractionalization, a, a, a property of a quantum spin liquid. Uh, then in the, uh, in the, I guess, around uh, 2005, uh, there was the publication of a solvable model by Kitaev that, that had a massive impact on the field because that was the first example of a truly you know, analytically solvable model of a, that really does form a quantum spin liquid. And it initiated uh, a search experimentally for materials that could realize this, uh, this kind of phase. Uh, uh, now, none of this has really concluded yet in terms of the materials work, uh, because I think there's no material that really is like convincingly known to be able to form a, a, a quantum spin liquid state in the low temperature limit. Um, and we'll get into a little bit some of the signatures that we like to see for a quantum spin liquid. But by no means have we given up. You know, there are a lot of people still working on this, uh, and um, it's generating a lot of interesting materials and, and very unusual uh, types of uh, signatures and behaviors in, in materials. Uh, I think more and more the emphasis, at, at least what I'm thinking about, is that we, that we should be able to look for spin liquid-like properties in materials, even though maybe in the ultimate low temperature limit, they will, will form some other kind of um, maybe a spin glass state or an ordered state, but there may still be higher energy features that have characteristics that are associated with spin liquid. That's kind of more certain to be able to be successful. Um, so anyway, I should say that uh, the uh, key types model really, sorry, really kind of uh, um, caused uh, a focus on uh, materials that were, had the honeycomb structure, which had not sort of previously been something one was uh, really focusing on because, uh, uh, you know, with near neighbor interactions, it's a bipartite lattice, and so it has an ordered state. Um, but um, now uh, people are really rummaging through the, uh, the ICSD and, and their 
um, and, and, and their experience to try to find materials that formed the uh, honeycomb structure. And uh, one of those is going to be the topic of our discussion today, it's barium cobalt arsenic oxide. Um, and um, it has this kind of, uh, this kind of um, structure, just looking at the honeycomb lattice itself. I'll show you the, the uh, lattice structure a little bit later again, but I want to first mention what essentially is the main uh, sort of effort that, that takes place in this, in this talk and in this work. It really is a question of distinguishing between two different types of frustration that you could have from the honeycomb lattice. Uh, so on the left is this kind of bond frustration, you could, you could say, which is really a frustration uh, in terms of the components of the, uh, of the Ising-like exchange interaction. Uh, on, in the uh, ketide model, uh, we have bond-dependent uh, anisotropic interactions, which command the same spin, let's say the spin on this side, to be um, aligned either anti or ferromagnetically with, um, with uh, a specific component, uh, but different components uh, for the three different near neighbor sites. This is one thing that's not actually possible to satisfy simultaneously. So you could say that you have a kind of frustration in this lattice. Um, but really, I'm not going to talk more about uh, how the Kitev model uh, can, is, is solved and, and all of the beautiful work that goes in that direction because it will turn out that the kind of frustration that exists in this compound that we've been looking at is actually completely different. It has to do with the um, uh, competing near and third near neighbor exchange interactions. So the green interaction here uh, will turn out to be a ferromagnetic interaction, so which favors a uh, uniform orientation for all the spins on the lattice. But then this third neighbor interaction is actually anti-ferromagnetic. And so as uh, you ramp up the third neighbor anti-ferromagnetic interaction, you destabilize uh, this otherwise uh, easy plane ferromagnetic state and drive it towards uh, an incommensurate uh, phase with a specific wave vector. Um, and it even appears that close to the transition between the, uh, the ferromagnetic and the zigzag type state that's, that's favored by the um, J3 interaction, uh, then there may in fact be some kind of a, a spin liquid phase existing. So there may still be, even though that the underlying model is quite different from what had been initially uh, anticipated, it may still still be that there is interesting physics uh, going on in this uh, in this material. Okay. So, so, so Colin, why is second nearest neighbor not so important in this compound? Any uh, second nearest sort of... neighbor can can also play a role, but it it doesn't. It's actually quite difficult to to identify it in uh, in um, uh, in some of the physical properties. I think we probably can put a limit on it in in a through spin wave measure, okay. um, but it, it doesn't seem to have a like a. Um, it, it basically reemphasizes some of what uh, what J J one what wants to do. So it doesn't play. It seems to not play a qualitative role, but I, I'm sure in detail there'll be an interesting impact of J two as well. But in our work, we've pretty much um, not, we're not paying a lot of attention to it. And you might say, well, why, why, why shouldn't you be paying attention to that? Well, one of the reasons is that it is in fact J3 that has the best shot at being a strong super exchange interaction. And then it also has this uh, significant uh, qualitative effect. Um, but I think we can say uh, for sure that it is J3 that stabilizes this, the kind of instability that we see in the compound. Okay. Um, yes. So here, here's then a couple of pictures of the of the crystal structure. And, and what I want to emphasize here is that this compound is also a fairly good uh, two-dimensional material. Um, the eventual antiferromagnetic order is a three-dimensional antiferromagnetic order. Um, but when we look at the excitations, we see that the strength of the interlayer coupling is, is so weak that we actually aren't able to see the corresponding dispersion of the spin wave excitations. Um, so they seem to be really, really two-dimensional. So in, in almost all of what I talk about going forward, we're mostly going to think about the uh, the two-dimensional, quasi-two-dimensional magnetism of the uh, of the material. Uh, and as you can see, the little sketch we have fairly good-sized uh, crystals can be made from this compound. Uh, one has to assemble a whole uh, kind of mosaic of these crystals to be able to uh, to do neutron experiments. But it's a perfectly feasible um, thing that uh, that we were able to do. Uh, now, it's a very anisotropic um, uh, antiferromagnet, uh, and you can see that uh, actually when you apply, uh, when you look at the susceptibility measurements uh, in a 
point four Tesla field for fields applied along the uh, in the plane, which is perpendicular to C, and for fields apply applied along C, uh, then actually the stability for fields in the plane, right? So, so the in-plane field, um, the susceptibility becomes 1.5 emu per moles, where it's uh, it's uh, basically two orders of magnitude smaller for fields in the C direction. So it's extremely easy plane, uh, actually 50 times larger, as you can see down here, uh, is the susceptibility for fields in plane compared to the outer plane susceptibility. Um, so it's an easy plane, definitely an easy plane system. Now, this strong anisotropy immediately alerts us to the uh, to the uh, to the contribution of the orbital uh, magnetism in this material, uh, and this is what we should expect, and and we'll always see in these three uh, D seven cobalt uh, compounds. And the argument for that uh, could be constructed uh, as as indicated here. Uh, this is this is using Hund's rule. We can develop uh, the total spin angular momentum and the total orbital angular momentum, and both of those are actually finite, they then combine by uh, spin orbit coupling. Uh, and since from spin one and spin three half, I can form spin half, spin three half, and spin five half, I end up with a uh, spin half, uh, 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 spin orbital angle momentum ground state. And so this is now going to be a spin degree of freedom that actually, uh, as you as you rearrange the spin, you're also changing the charge distribution on the ion. And so we're going to expect that there will be anisotropies associated with that. And, and it's reflected, as we've just mentioned, in the very strongly easy plane uh, anisotropy of the, uh, of the system. And so this is actually what we want to be able to have um, keta if interactions. Uh, and so this is part of the reason that, that uh, cobalt is a, is a good choice uh, to try to realize, or is a possible choice to try to realize uh, keta if type physics. Um, now, to say a few words about the phase diagram of, of this material, uh, then shown here is the AC susceptibility as a function of applied DC field at various different temperatures. And you can see that if I go to the uh, the lowest temperature here, 1.8 Kelvin, uh, then there is a phase transition at around 0 0.5, um, uh, 0 0.55 Tesla. Uh, we'll return to that phase transition uh, uh, quite a bit, actually. Um, and then as you heat up, uh, get up to around uh, five or six Kelvin, then you, you leave the ordered state uh, entirely. Uh, if you look a little bit more in detail, then you find additional features in the AC susceptibility at, at much lower fields, indicating additional field-driven uh, phase transitions. Now, all of these measurements are done with the field in the basal plane, as a perpendicular to C, uh, and that is really where you get the strongest uh, field response. When you apply the field along the C axis, if the sample doesn't kind of fall off because that's the hard axis, uh, then in many cases, you'll be dominated by the impacts of a small um, a deviation from being completely perpendicular to, uh, to the plane. So a small in-plane component is difficult to avoid, in fact, because it's so anisotropic. Just a couple of degrees will cause you to be uh, impacted by this in-plane uh, component. So we, we're going to mostly look at the... At the um, properties of the material with the field in the plane. Uh, so here we have then the, the field temperature phase diagram, temperature is vertical axis. And so here's this field driven phase transition at, at low temperatures. And here is uh, from this 2020 paper by Zong and, and Kava, the, the question mark uh, Kita corner spin liquid phase, which, uh, which was um, considered uh, to possibly be in present a little bit like an alpha ruthenium chloride in this uh, field range where you end up suppressing the uh, magnetic order state. Um, but as indicated here, there are additional phases actually uh, existing um, as, you, as you apply magnetic field uh, at, at, uh, at finite temperatures. Uh, and you can also see actually, if you look at magnetization uh, versus field and trace an entire hysteresis curve that there's quite kind of complicated stuff going on at really low fields. And in fact, those are those are very much signatures of some kind of an incommensurate magnetic order that's that's uh, developing uh, that's developing in the in the compound. And so to look for that kind of uh, physics to really study these um, <clears throat> modulated uh, modulated complicated magnetic structures, you really need something like neutron scattering uh, to work that out. And uh, so we'll be using neutrons and um, uh, we'll both be using them to probe the static magnetic structure and the dynamic magnetic structure. 
And I, I like to remind uh, students who, who might be on the call um, of some of the aspects of this technique. Um, uh, so it, it, it is a scattering technique, very much like X-ray scattering. We, we have incident beam of neutrons and we detect the probability of scattering um, from state Ki to state Kf. And we can transfer energy and momentum and we'll be measuring the scattering probability, if you will, as a function of momentum and energy transfer. Um, and so it, it really is this uh, uh, partial differential scattering cross-section that, uh, that we're going to be measuring. Um, and we have two different interactions. We have a, a nuclear interaction, uh, which is shown over here with a red box. Uh, that's the, uh, the Fermi soda potential, which is a uh, uh, result of the strong force interaction with the nucleus. And then on the left, we have uh, the uh, elect electromagnetic interaction, really just a dipole-dipole interaction between the uh, magnetic moment of the neutron and the uh, internal field generated uh, in the material by electron spin and, and spin orbital angular momentum of the, of the electrons. And that gives rise to um, two different, uh, what we call dynamic correlation functions. Um, from the nuclear cross-section, we have the density-density uh, correlation function, and this will give us the chemical structure as well as the, uh, as the uh, phonon uh, vibrational excitations in the material. Uh, and from the magnetic interaction, we measure this entity, which is the two-point dynamic correlation function. The, um, the elastic part of the, the energy equals to zero part tells us the static spin structure, um, and the inelastic part tells us the, the, um, uh, all of the different kinds of excitations that might be present uh, in the material. And so we actually, the neutrons know exactly what it is we're measuring. We can really uh, directly relate the measured quantity to this two-point uh, correlation function. This is an important characteristic of the, of the technique. Now, another thing I want to point out that when we look at our scattering data, uh, then we typically find, um, uh, uh, we may often find this kind of trace through energy momentum space uh, that we'll only see in elastic scattering at, at, over a surface that lies in this four-dimensional momentum energy space. And that actually uh, is the situation that, sorry, that, that will happen, excuse me. That's the situation that happens when we have a single particle scattering process. We're actually creating or annihilating a single quasi-particle in the process of scattering. On the other hand, we also have cases where there's a, actually a full continuum of scattering that, that is observed. Um, and that has a very specific interpretation as well. That means that we don't have, it means that we have some, something beyond single particle scattering. Um, and it, it could be as a result of a fractionalization so that instead of um, creating and annihilating a single particle in the scattering process, we're actually making uh, multiple particles as we uh, go through scattering. Um, and we'll see that that is something that is um, anticipated and, and is observed in materials that have, um, that have uh, um, uh, spin liquid-like properties. Um, all right, now the... Methods um, uh, that we use have actually changed a lot over the last, uh, I'd, I'd say, decade. Uh, in particular, we've we've moved more and more towards the use of spallation neutron sources uh, to to carry out these experiments. Um, and here's a picture from the spallation neutron source in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, it's now a source that can operate at 1.7 megawatt and is on its way towards uh, towards even higher power. Um, and it has allowed us really to to carry out a, a Quite different type of experiment where we're really measuring the entire um, uh, the entire uh, dynamic correlation function in a, in a four-dimensional momentum energy space. Uh, so a lot of progress uh, as a result of using this kind of facility. But we're still using reactive facilities as well, both at Oak Ridge uh, and also at the NIST Center for Neutron Research. Here's a picture of the NIST Center for Neutron Research uh, reactor. Um, it's a 20 megawatt reactor and uh, at this facility, we've uh, built, and, and uh, uh, Ping Cheng mentioned this, uh, the MAX instrument, um, which is an instrument that is um, that covers the whole kind of plane of scattering uh, more or less at once, uh, and is very powerful for uh, measuring um, uh, measuring low energy excitations in materials that have um, either continue of scattering or that have very slow quasi particles. Um, so it's sort of tailored for the kind of research that we're doing. And we would love to be able to use it uh, 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 soon uh, because, and, and here I just want to give a little um, uh, mention out to that there's been a, uh, there, there was a technical problem with the NIST uh, reactor in about uh, 
two years ago, I guess now. Um, and um, and for that reason, it's it's now uh, not operating. It's operating at very low power. And uh, we're, we're hoping very much that in the fall, um, uh, so a little later this year, perhaps, uh, that it'll be able to operate again. But we don't know exactly because all the technical work has to be done. Uh, but I just want to, as a person working with neutron scattering, uh, indicate uh, how important this facility is actually for a lot of the work that we're doing and for the um, and and for the, um, uh, the the health, if you will, and availability of neutrons uh, for material science in the United States. So we're hoping that this facility will soon be able to uh, be uh, operational again. This is the picture from the Max uh, instrument where some of these experiments were actually uh, conducted. Okay, so now let me get back to the to the. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, please. It's a couple slides back. So you had shown this um, these nice metamagnetic transitions, and you said that they were suggestive of incommensurate order. I'm just curious, what's sort of like the the logic behind that? Why could it not be a commensurate but many unit cell? Uh, oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, that's that's a good point. Um, so, so I mean, I think our sort of intuition is formed by the experiences that we've had over the years. And and what I'd say is that um, uh, having this kind of hysteretic behavior in an antiferromagnetic system, um, that so the hysteretic behavior is quite familiar, obviously, in ferromagnets, where it has to do with the you know, the motion of domain walls in the material. So a very complicated structure that arises out of dipole interactions, essentially, in a ferromagnet. So you need that kind of complexity to have, you know, bistability in the in the magnetic system. And so if I find an antiferromagnet with this kind of hysteresis, I would say that I, I have some kind of a very complicated landscape of different kind of orders that, um, that, um, that I'm uh, selecting between with the applied magnetic field. Um, but uh, the, but you asking can I can I say that it's you know that it's commensurate as as compared to incommensurate and that probably is not I, I think you're quite right that it could as well be a system with many different commensurate phases that I'm I'm not able to make the transition um, you know I or I make it in a different way as I increase field compared to decreasing field so I I think really what what we're seeing. By this uh, hysteresis is that we have a very complicated landscape of different ordered phases in the antiferromagnetic system. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any, any other questions? Yeah, so, so Colin, I mean, so, so has the spin spiral structure been completely solved in the intermediate phase? I, I think it pretty much has. Uh, and I, I refer you to this very nice paper in a, published in a rather unusual place, uh, which is Hel Helion. <laughs> 2018. But this is really a like a it's a real treatise, and they really, really go through in very great detail the use of the um of the uh, cryopad method, which is a polarized beam uh, technique to to determine the spin structure. And this this is really like the gold standard for how to determine these spin structures. Um so I, I think they've done a very thorough uh job on that. Um okay. I think this the state is is actually known from this uh, from this work. And here are pictures of these spin structures. They they make distinctions that are not possible to make using conventional unpolarized uh, methods. It's really a very, very beautiful work. Uh, as you know, Leo uh, 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 Louis Pierre Regnault is is very much dedicated to the use of this method. And so this yeah, is, he's, he's an absolute expert on that. Yeah. An absolute expert. I think he did it after he retired, so he was able to have enough time to really. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, so thank you. What he, in in this picture is actually from his his um uh, his earlier work, which was from the nineties. You know, so uh, and there he found these various phase boundaries as a function of applied magnetic field, where you go through you know different uh, uh, different wave vectors, and then eventually at sufficiently high field going beyond about three. Uh, 0.5 uh, kiloaster, then you get into a commensurate modulated state with with a well, it's commensurate within the plane, but it, it actually still seems to have an incommensurate component out of the plane. So it, it is a fully three-dimensional ordered state. Um, and it is like doubly incommensurate. So an in incommensurability within the plane as well as between the planes. But in my talk, I'm not actually focusing very much on the interplane effects um, uh, because we do see barely any dispersion at all in that direction. But it's once the two-dimensional order develops 
then a registry between the planes also appears and, and that's that has this wave vector 1.31 it, it like it appears to be in fact also incommensurate so a fairly complicated state one important point to point out is point to point out is that the spins are actually cantered a little bit out of the plane by seven degrees mm -hmm. uh, and that i think is actually a vestige of the uh, of the it may be a vestige of the of the kita if terms that that still are present albeit quite small in the material so that's what kind of uh, forces the spins to come out of the plane a little bit that's the kind of thing that using this uh, current pad measurement, one can really get a handle on those angles. That's very difficult otherwise. Thank you. That's the ordered state. And so then to, to come back to what we're trying to distinguish in this work uh, is really two different, um, uh, what we really should say is we're trying to determine the spin Hamiltonian. And when we came into the project, we, we thought that this was in fact a Kitaev um, system. Um, and uh, so we thought that the relevant frustration had to do with um, with this uh, bond dependent Ising like interaction. And um, what I put down here is the Hamiltonian describing this uh, kind of uh, interaction. And the particular term, which is the the Kitaev term, uh, is this part of the term here. So it's it's a um, it is a inter an Ising interaction. So just one component of the spin is involved, but a different component for the three different nearest neighbors. Um, now, uh, to describe this interaction, it's appropriate to use a coordinate system which has um, uh, which has the one 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 direction coming out of the plane. So coming at you is going to be the one 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 uh, one comma one comma one uh, direction. Um, of a coordinate system which is has its x, y, and what? z axis perpendicular to the three nearest neighbor bond. Uh, what? Directions. Right. So I've got the x. What are you that? Yeah. Hey, Zoom. Now we've got someone who should mute there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you can you uh, mute if unless you have a question, please uh, mute your microphone. Thank you. And then so these are all uh, the projection onto the uh, onto the honeycomb layer. Um, are perpendicular to the nearest neighbor bonds, but they're coming out of the plane, the x, y, z axis, in such a way that the that the one comma one comma one direction is oriented uh, directly uh, along the c axis of the system. The geometry, so the geometry is a little bit. Uh, you, you you can easily get uh, um, uh, get lost in it, uh, perhaps. Uh, but uh, so we're actually dealing with two different coordinate systems in this talk. Uh, to describe the Kitaev interaction, we use this XYZ coordinate system, which is sort of sticking out of the plane. Um, uh, all axes are sticking out of the plane, oriented like that. To describe the XXZ interaction, we use a um, we use a, a, a coordinate system which has XYZ direction, XY directions are in the honeycomb layer, and Z is coming out along the C-axis. So that's kind of the more natural, perhaps the more natural plane to be to be thinking about. Um, uh, but for the Kita Eva interaction, you really, really need to use this particular um, uh, coordinate system. Now, I should emphasize that we can make conversions between the parameters for the Kita Eva model and for the J1, J3 model. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing uh, that forces us to use the one or the other coordinate system. And we, and in fact, in our paper, we make, uh, we have the conversions between uh, exchange interactions when defined in the one as, com as compared to the other coordinate system. Um, so these are the two models that we're trying to, to actually distinguish between. And it turns out that, um, in fact, just from the character of the, inc of the uh, magnetic order, it's actually possible to, to, um, to make the uh, distinction. And uh, let me show you how that, uh, how that uh, happens, actually. Um, and so first, let me show you what is the, the uh, characteristic wave vector of the magnetic order. And this is what was also determined you know, uh, by Louis-Pierre Pagnot, but I'm just showing you in our, own, uh, in our own measurements and how it kind of comes out. Uh, so this is now the, uh, the reciprocal lattice basal plane of this, of this material. And I'm showing you elastic scattering, energy transfer is equals to zero. And we see this kind of, Set of uh, six peaks that surround the uh, the nuclear reciprocal lattice point. So this point is a nuclear reciprocal lattice point. This one as well, and this one as well. So these are the six points. But then surrounding those are an additional six little satellite um, locations, and those are the uh, are the peaks that associate with the uh, with this modulated magnetic order. Um, 
Now you might say, well, how is it possible he mentioned that there was an out of plane wave vector component as well? Well, it turns out that um, that our resolution is is such that we can still pick up um, some diffraction uh, um, as a result of some broadening of the uh, of the of the peak along the L direction. So we still actually see it when we look at nominally the uh, the um, the basal plane. We still see these six uh, reflections, and. Um, uh, just to get ourselves oriented, then this is the real space uh, uh, honeycomb lattice with the A and B vectors associated with that. The reciprocal lattice vectors uh, are going to be perpendicular to real space uh, vectors. So A star is perpendicular to B, B star is perpendicular to A. And so this is the orientation of the A star and B star direction of my reciprocal space. And where I see the, um, the uh, satellite reflection is actually in these locations here, which is uh, like uh, an HOO type location. And so that is the point that we call the M, uh, M point, or in other words, the, um, the satellite peaks lie along the gamma to M direction of reciprocal space. And that turns out to not be possible to obtain by the key table model alone to obtain a instability at the M point. Um, <clears throat> however, with the J3 interaction, that's exactly the kind of um, the kind of incremental state that we uh, that uh, is that uh, we expect to see from the J1 J3 model. So, really, to be able to have that kind of magnetic order, you really need a J3 interaction to be present. Um, now, mm -hmm. then you could say, well, why don't you just use a a Kita model with a J3 interaction? And that is also a possibility. Um, but uh, in this work, we've we've actually um, that the, the parameter space is fairly large for interaction. So we, what we've been able to do, and you'll see that it, even then it's fairly kind of uh, involved, um, that if we, if we specifically focus on these two models, then we're able to exclude um, uh, the, this, uh, the left one. So it was in the red box, but the J1, J3 model, we are able to actually get a fairly good description of all of the physical properties that we measured using that particular model. Um, um sorry yes can i ask you about uh Rignos 2018 paper yes well from my understanding it seems to point to a more collinear state with, with sort of like up up down down state not a incommensurate state um but the the well i mean the the wave vector is what it what is mentioned here, which would make it, uh, you know, technically. Um, I mean, the the question of whether it really is a rational fraction or not is difficult to answer experimentally. But this is the wave vector. I don't think that changed in that work. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Colin, one more question. Yeah. Um, the six satellites that sit around. Uh, your Bragg peaks, I yeah. guess they're all Bragg peaks. Um, is there some uh, easy way to understand the intensity modulation that two of them are much uh, less bright than the other four? Yeah, that that is fairly straightforward to understand, but you have to write, I, um, you have to basically, um, you know, you have to, um, that modulation is going to tell you uh, something about what happens within the, uh, within the quasi unit cell. So if I if I make k to be approximately one third OO, then then I have a commensurate unit cell, and then basically what's inside that unit cell is what's giving rise to this modulation of the of the peak intensities. Um, so it's yeah, I, I can't give you a, uh, a like a it, that's a good question. I can't give you a, a like a back of the envelope explanation for why these particular two peaks are uh, weaker than the others, but that is part of a of a fingerprint of that particular spin structure. Okay. And and really you you know to really determine this kind of spin structure you need to then go out to, to larger Q to then also have this arrangement of the six satellites out here and they will have a different uh, you know modulate pattern of modulation between them. And so all of that is the normal way that we that we determine the ordered magnetic structures. Colin, I'm sorry, uh, just uh, one follow-up. Yeah. Uh, is it coming from different domains as well, or is just one domain giving you all six peaks? 
Uh, these, oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> that's a very good question. And that, that, um, uh, uh, that can be very difficult to, to separate out actually. Um, but, and uh, I'm not sure I can, um, I, I think the, the understanding so far is that it is actually a single, uh, that this is actually from multiple domains. Um, and so this is zero field, right? So. This is zero field that, that, okay, that yeah. those different distinct domains will be present in the material. Um, uh, but I, I have to think a bit whether we really have the, the, the proof that it's not a multi-case structure. Um, I, I think it comes about because you can't make a multi-case structure that will be uh, equal spin size um, uh, that, that has this wave vector. Um, so you, you might be forced by that reasoning to have um, to have distinct uh, wave vector. Sure, but but the, the symmetry just can tell you how many domains you can have. And, yeah. uh, at least at least that that could uh, yeah the, the the intensity variation is the most interesting one. But maybe maybe something. Yeah, the is one of the variations not having to do with the domain population. That that's a you could have that kind of uh, impression, but that's not the case because because we have, for example, this peak is weak, but this peak is strong, but they belong to the same domain. Okay, I got it's it. Not yeah. the domain population. This 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 looks like a, uh, you know an equal occupation of the three different types of domains that we could have. Um, so yeah, so. So then let me, let me see how I think that time. Yeah. So then, then uh, let me now begin to look at the inelastic scattering. And the point I want to make with this is that the material actually looks pretty much like a, a two-dimensional ferromagnet in its excitations. Um, uh, at least when I come up a little bit in field, when I help it, if you will, a little bit with an in-plane field, I can drive it into an easy plane ferromagnetic state. And then it really behaves like you would expect for an easy plain ferromagnet. Uh, but when we remove the field and go into the incrementary state, yeah, then we do see the fact that it's modulated and some additional complexities. But it, you really notice this kind of proximity to a 2D ferromagnet. Um, so first, I'm showing you once again the, the at low temperatures, the, uh, the pattern of, of the Bragg peaks. Um, and then I'm going to come up in energy transfer to two milli electron volts. So now you know, the this little set of satellite peaks is no longer visible, but they've kind of merged together to an entire ring of, of uh, intensity. And then I, as I come to higher energy transfer to four milli electron volt, then the diameter of this ring basically has um, has um, has uh, has increased. And then finally, I, I end up with these kind of rings all the way up at seven milli electron volts. And those are the rings around the the uh, the gamma point uh, where I'm, where I have um, allowed uh, magnetic reflections for the ferromagnetic state, uh, and so I'm sort of falling back to what you expect just for ferromagnetic spin waves with this parabolic dispersion around the around the gamma point. So this is what happens when I go like to higher and higher energy transfer. I lose uh, the signatures of the competing interactions, and I notice it kind of reveals itself as essentially being an easy plane ferromagnet. And you see similar things if you go to temperatures above the ordering temperature. Um, so at low, uh, at, at low fields and at elastic scattering, I now no longer have these satellite peaks. Uh, but then when I come up towards high energy transfer, now I'm in a paramagnetic state. Uh, then I see these kind of um, filled in, I've kind of filled in the rings, if you will. Uh, but I, I still have this kind of blob of intensity. Uh, and then as I come up in energy transfer to formula electron volts, now it's actually, you know, not that easy to distinguish these uh, from each other. I think the intensity is actually is is actually quite uh, is quite different, but um, but the overall pattern looks fairly fairly similar. And then I come up to high energies, and then I have a quite large, a quite significant similarity between what happens at low temperatures and at high temperatures. But I mean, I'm, it, this is not to say that I have spin waves, but I have some kind of a paramagnetic, paramagnum type uh, fluctuation that look a little bit like uh, like what you'd expect for a system that's near ferromagnetic instability. Um, so now let me look at the low temperature excitation spectrum uh, in, in a different way. So I'm, I'm looking now at the momentum energy dependence of the, uh, of the scattering. And this is this is uh, what it looks like. So I'm, I'm having wave vector transfer along the gamma M direction. Uh, and remember that the uh, the wave vector for the ordered state 
which still exists actually is at 0.3. Uh, so that's, uh, let me see, this is half. So it's, uh, so it's a point, uh, it's one, two, three, four, five. So it's 0.2, 0 0.4, so 0 0.3. So this, this is where the wave vector is actually, but there's no, there's no soft mode or anything like that. Uh, we simply have this excitation spectrum, which looks a bit like what you'd expect for a, uh, for a, for a ferromagnet, if you will. Uh, but there are other things that, that, I think indicate the complexity of the system. One thing is that there's a gap in the excitation spectrum that indicates the the orbital contribution to the uh, to to the to the moment, which makes it anisotropic and gives a gap in the excitation spectrum. And also, you see actually various other features like these these extra copies of things uh, and also a continuum of scattering. And all of that is real stuff that's in the dynamic correlation function of the system. And and basically shows us that there is something more complex going on in this in this material. Now I'm going to apply a magnetic field along the uh, the what we call the B direction. So that would be uh, perpendicular to the momentum direction, uh, because that's perpendicular to A star. And uh, I go to 0.4 test. So that brings me into the commensurate state. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not there's some kind of changes. I, I move the spectrum up a little bit. Then we go to 0.75, which is now beyond the uh, the ordered phase. So I'm now driven it into a uh, kind of a, a, a um, polarized um, paramagnet. So it's it's kind of in, in a uh, yeah, it's in a highly magnetized state, almost almost fully magnetized, uh, and we get this kind of uh, parabolic dispersion relation, which is very much what you would expect for a 2D ferromagnet. But I still have very strong intensity here at the two magnet location. And also additional uh, continuum scattering uh, within the cone itself. Um, um, but then once I get to three Tesla, all of that pretty much is suppressed, and I now have simply the uh, the uh, uh, the dispersion relation that you expect for an anisotropic um, ferromagnet. Um, and as I now increase the field uh, more, then this mode is driven to even higher uh, to even higher fields. Here is a plot of the spectrum of scattering uh, as a function of field. And, and so this region here, I, I've had to divide by 10 because this is a really an immense peak. Uh, but you can see additional, all of this is, is real magnetic scattering in the system. Uh, and so as I come up to 0.75 Tesla, which is a little bit beyond the point where you suppress the magnetic order, we have a very strong peak uh, very close to the two magnum uh, point. So twice this energy is, is where you tend to see this peak. Um, and But then when I drive up to three Tesla, then I significantly suppressed these, uh, these two magnum uh, contributions and most of the intensity lies in the coherent mode. So there certainly is interesting continuum scattering in this uh, in the system. Um, and uh, this may relate to its potential for uh, spin liquid type Physics. Uh, Colin, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, is, what is that flat band near 3.25? 3. 3. Uh, that is a good question. I think that's that. Um, the real or, or artifact? The good, uh, I think, oh, I think I might have to owe you a, a response on that. I don't want to say okay. wrong. Okay. Record, okay. But there are, yeah, so Ping Cheng is this is referring to um, that there are various kinds of um, uh, spurious processes that are known and that can happen. So I sh I should know that, but I forget if that's uh, if that is. Also, it. the other question I have is that uh, in the fully polarized. I think that's a, I think that's a spurious thing. Actually, you see it here; it shows okay. up it completely fixed at all of these locations. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the other thing, the question I have is, let's say that's a spurious. The other question I have is that let's say you fully polarize it you know, for simple floral magnet on a honeycomb lattice, you should expect to see optical mode as well, right? Where's yeah, the optical yes. mode? Yeah, you, we, we did see it. <laughs> what what where is it? Very good point, and we do actually see it, and but it's at higher energy. I see. Okay. And I, I'll show you in, in actually in the next, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, here it is, in fact. Okay, 15 millivolt. Okay. okay. All the way up at 15 milli electron volts. And that that is it's that's Actually, we uh, the, the reason that these data are a little bit uh, uh, noisy is is that you know the way these experiments happen is that you're really at the instrument and you're trying you you're trying to plan your you know with neutron scanning you have let's say five days or six days it's a fairly concentrated period of time and uh, at some point we decided we said exactly as Peng Cheng was saying there ought to be an optic mode 
And so we kind of lashed out and eventually we, we were able to find this one mode uh, at all the way up at this energy, having spent quite a long time looking at the low energy parts of the spectrum. So this is the optic. Uh, this is in fact the optic mode. And it's very important for the determination of the spin Hamiltonian. Uh, so what happens then at the gamma point near five millivolts? What is that? Uh, five millivolts. It, it, the E, panel E. What uh, is that? This thing? Yeah. This thing is, um, I think that's, that is good. Um, uh, it might be a continuum, bottom of the continuum. Yeah. But, but he said it's fully polarized. Uh, no, it's, it's getting fairly polarized, but if you see here, there still is, you know, th so this mode, it's, I know, you know, this is, this is a, uh, is a spurious component, this one, but this is not. So this thing okay. you can see comes and goes with feel. And that one actually lies at, at uh, you know, 4.3 milli electron volt, which is twice this energy. So there still is two magnet scattering present. Okay, okay, okay. May I ask something else, Colin? Yes. So, so it looks like you go through the transition to the polarized phase, even if it's fluctuating or it's not fully polarized. But you go without uh, observing any mode which uh, vanishes. Are you not observing the right points or? Gapless mode? Yeah, gapless mode at the transition, at the, at the HC to the, to the nominally polarized phase, to the paramagnetic phase. Uh, uh, actually, we are now, this, this particular thing kind of steps over the critical uh, the critical field of 0.55 tests. Okay, so it's it's a very very quick uh, decline of the gap at the and gamma point. Is, even at 0.75, you can see there's stuff down here, and so there yeah. is. Okay. Kind of so the, the critical field is 0 0.5 or something, 0 0.55. Yeah, 0 0.55. Yeah. Yeah. So here, so can you can you go slower at 0 0.4 then? So you have you had the data at 0 0.4. Yeah. I didn't. This guy here. Yeah. So this one is pretty close to the transition from the inner side of the phase diagram, side. and still it's uh, it's quite gapped. So it's rather abrupt uh, change. Yes, and you never have, you know, you never have intensity actually at the um, at the incommensurate wave vector. That really puzzled has puzzled many many of us. This is where the incommensurate wave vector is. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank so you. basically, the stuff is a quasi ferro magnet, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, that's what it is. That's that's. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it comes out very clearly in the data. Now I'm going to spend a little time talking about the um, all of the theoretical analysis that that went into trying to figuring the spin Hamiltonian, and um, I, I guess the first thing I should say is that uh, here I have shown the dispersion relation that includes the dispersion along the c axis, and you can see that it's really completely flat to the experimental accuracy. Um, we just have this completely flat uh, mode. And actually we've, we've uh, zoomed in on that a little, a little bit more by looking at a couple of different fields, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, 0 0.75 and three Tesla. And at each field we've shown the intensity as a function of, uh, as a function of in plane and out of plane wave vector right near the gap energy. And if there had been any kind of uh, significant interaction, um, uh, I mean, we know there is an interaction between planes, but uh, it, uh, if it was significant in terms of the excitations, then you'd see this mode, this line would kind of wander, but it, it actually stays completely kind of fixed. And so at all of these fields, we, we're not, uh, we don't actually detect significant uh, uh, Interlayered dispersion. It's really a completely flat mode. So we very much go to a two dimensional model. Um, okay, so then uh, the, um, the, the this is then the, uh, the the data that we're going to use in the uh, in the fitting uh, uh, in the in the fitting of the spin Hamiltonian. So we're going to use three Tesla in plane field, and we'll be looking at the. Um, the mode that we call M1 mode, uh, that's low energy mode, and its gap as well as the gap of the M2 mode. So th those will be two energy scales that we'd be following as a function of a magnetic field. And we have a particular path that we go through the, uh, the process because there's so many variables in the Hamiltonian that it, it, we have to be kind of systematic about it. And, and it was quite, a, uh, quite an effort to, to convince ourselves that we had sort of a, um, uh, a, 
I, I wouldn't say that it's a unique model, but to really arrive at the model was actually a bit of, a, of an exploration. And so the first thing we did was that we used, uh, and this is very much the work of young Vic Kim uh, and, and, uh, and his team and Tom Halloran, uh, also in my group was heavily involved in this. Um, and so uh, this plot shows you the gap energy. So the lower energy gap is a function of applied magnetic field. We know separately from susceptibility measurements, the, the in-plane G factor. Um, and so uh, it is possible to determine the field dependence of that gap um, uh, for each of the two models that we're interested in, the, the uh, Kitaev, J, K, Gamma, Gamma prime, and the J1, J3 models, so that these can be calculated in uh, conventional spin wave, uh, classical one over S spin wave theory, and you get these two expressions. And you'll notice that uh, in the expression for the Kitaev model, what shows up is the, is, uh, is the gamma and gamma one parameters. They always appear as gamma plus two gamma one, and uh, J and K, that's the Heisenberg component and the Kitaev component, always show up as three J plus K. So that becomes kind of the parameters that we can extract from this kind of uh, analysis. Likewise, for the J1, J3, we have the sum of J1 and J3 for the in and out of plane components. Those are the parameters that, that show up. So we would claim that from the measurement of the, uh, of the size of the M2 gap, um, so that, that was this, this energy scale here, M2, which I know at three Tesla, and from the field dependence of the M1 mode, then we should be able to determine uh, those two parameters for each of the models. And so that actually is what this uh, figure shows. It shows for the Kita event for the J1, J3 model, a plot of a chi-squared analysis, uh, which is comparing the field dependent um, gap energies and this M2 mode, uh, dependent on what my choice of, of those parameters that enter into the spin wave theory. And it turns out that there are two solutions for each of the models. So the Kitaev model, this combination of parameters will work, and this combination of parameters will perfectly describe those, uh, those two types of data. Likewise, here, I have actually two solutions possible. Um, and so we will not be able to distinguish between those by only looking at those data. So uh, to be able to distinguish, we have to look at the phase diagram uh, as a function of um, the two other parameters. That, um, and so what's shown here, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is quite kind of elegant uh, 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 that, that uh, Young, Vic, Kim and, and company did. They show the phase diagram as a function of gamma and K while having fixed, um, uh, while having fixed uh, gamma and and uh, and gamma prime and three uh, j plus k to be at, at these minima that are consistent with the other data. So this is the this is kind of a phase diagram within this constrained parameter space. Um, and um, <clears throat> what they find is that as you vary k and j gamma while keeping uh, you know by being able to describe the other data, then you're able to generate these different kinds of phases within the uh, Kitaev model or these kinds of phases within the Kitaev model. However, within the Kitaev model, you can only generate an incommensurate state with a wave vector that goes between the gamma and the K point. You cannot have, you know, constrained by the other information, we have a incommensurate state with a wave vector between the gamma and the M point. So that actually is, we think is enough to exclude the straight out uh, Kitaev model without a J3 interaction. Now, when you throw in the J3 interaction and, and turn uh, to the XXC model, then in fact, you do have uh, a spiral state which has a wave vector that, uh, that is uh, consistent with the experimentally determined uh, low temperature component of in-plane uh, wave vector. And uh, you can now see to what extent that constrains uh, the JZ interaction and the, and the uh, so the near neighbor uh, uh, Z component and an and easy plane type uh, interaction. And so um, by combining these data, we actually arrive, uh, we first of all are able to exclude the, uh, the Kitaev model, the near neighbor Kitaev model as a, as a description of the system. But we find that this kind of model that has, um, that has an easy plane near and next and third near neighbor interaction and it needs to have these uh, additional uh, uh, off-diagonal anisotropic uh, exchange terms, D and E, 
appearing in order to induce a gap in the excitation spectrum. Otherwise, it would be an easy plane uh, system and would have to have a gapless mode. So you need these to actually uh, produce uh, the gap at low temperatures. Um, and um, just want to point out, I have to be careful in my time. I want to point out that um, the ratio of the third near neighbor easy plane interaction to the first near neighbor interaction turns out to be 0 0.33. And a little bit later in the talk, this will turn out to be an interesting uh, result uh, because it places the material very close to a critical point and possibly a critical phase. Um, and so, and also we able to get a limit on the uh, on the Kitaev term within this uh, within this model because these off diagonal terms actually translate into a, uh, a bond dependent interaction, uh, and the limits on that are given here as compared to the J the nearest neighbor interaction. Now, with that set of parameters, and we we don't claim that this is a unique like this is the only model that would work, but it. It is a model that does uh, work, and so we are now going to take that model and calculate things that we've that we've observed experimentally. And one of those is, of course, the excitation spectrum um, uh, at three Tesla, and so that's now being calculated here. And this is now using um, uh, what's called a molecular. Um, uh, no, sorry, this this is just using linear spin wave theory, actually, and so uh, produces this mode as well as as, as well as this mode uh, at three. Tesla and and, um, and this was a two Kelvin uh, two Kelvin measurement. The other thing uh, that we that turned out to be uh, quite a good indicator is we're showing here the magnetization measurement for two different field directions. So these are in-plane field directions, but rotating either along the A direction or along the perpendicular B star direction. So two perpendicular directions in the plane, either along the bond, uh, the nearest neighbor bond uh, direction, or along the third near neighbor bond direction. And it turns out that the material does, is not very anisotropic. Um, and here you can see once I get uh, above uh, about 0.5, uh, about 0.55 uh, Tesla, then I'm almost completely uh, saturated in the magnetization, almost went completely ferromagnetic in the plane. Um, and uh, this saturation is actually not strongly dependent on the orientation. And that is exactly what you get for the J1, J3, XXZ model that we, mm -hmm. that postulated it, it does actually give this kind of uh, almost isotropic in-plane behavior. Whereas the uh, whenever you have a dominant Kitaev interaction, then it becomes extremely anisotropic in its magnetization response. And so we're mentioning this because that can be kind of a, a um, uh, like a fingerprint of Kitaev physics would be a, a, a fairly anisotropic magnetization curve, in-plane anisotropic magnetization curve. This is not seen in this, in this compound. Uh, the other thing that can be calculated, and here we're using, or what Youngbek Kim is using what he calls molecular dynamics. So he does Monte Carlo simulation to generate a thermal uh, low energy state and uh, low energy classical state in the system. And then um, uh, he follows the, uh, the uh, dynamics from that state uh, in a molecular dynamic uh, uh, method, and then can actually construct the entire dynamic correlation function with very few um, uh, you know, limitations, uh, it can be a big system size, um, uh, but it is a fully classical calculation. Um, it still has nonlinear uh, spin dynamics in it. So it goes in a sense beyond uh, conventional spin wave theory and, and can actually produce uh, continuum scattering as well. And so he's taken the models that, that are sort of closest to accounting for the data that we know this model doesn't actually account for, for example, for the ordered state, and then he does this molecular dynamics to get uh, to get the corresponding excitation spectrum at zero Tesla. And then when applying a field of three Tesla, then with molecular dynamics, uh, you know, uh, what is found is actually a excitation spectrum, which is quite consistent with what is seen experimentally, really well, you know, fairly sharp modes of excitation. Whereas uh, the JK gamma gamma prime in molecular dynamics would actually have very strong continuum scattering. Um, and uh, so a classical effect, but also something which is not seen experimentally at three. Mm -hmm. So it's another indicator that we really are talking about a J1, J3 model. Okay, now I have to be a bit... You know, this yeah, yeah, I think I think you almost running out of time. Well, so people people might ask questions, yeah. Okay. Let me just, as a final thing, I want to, um, I would like to show you this, and I, I hope Peng Chen will 
<laughs> this is a recent uh, yeah. archive paper that uh, came out, uh, which is looking for a very key signature of spin liquid physics, which is a finite limit of thermal conductivity divided by temperature in the low temperature limit. And that actually is a characteristic that, or a measurement that has put to rest several different materials that were potential spin liquid candidates. If they don't pass this test, they, they really can't be a spin liquid. Uh, and so this was a natural thing to look at, and they've done it as a function of applied field in the plane. And uh, the data is shown here. Uh, this, this is as a function of temperature for various fields. And if you zoom in on the lower field regime, you find that uh, you find that uh, sorry, sorry, zoom in on the um, on the uh, on that critical field regime, you find that they actually do converge towards uh, towards a finite value. Of course, the measurements were done down to dilution fridge temperatures, not to really zero temperature. And so there is some kind of an ex extrapolation taking place. But from that, there's a regime of fields where you actually have a finite limit of cup over T. So that's a really interesting uh, observation. And it's also seen in several samples. This is an, another sample where a similar thing is observed. Uh, so, uh, so there may be some life in this, in this compound. Uh, maybe it's because they're fractionalized excitations, or possibly there's, there's maybe we're near some kind of a critical point. Uh, there's another paper I want to call your attention to by Arun Paramakanti uh, and his group, uh, in which they have uh, used here uh, DMRG uh, to, um, to, to examine that particular J1, J3, XXZ model. And what they find actually is very interesting uh, when they plot the phase diagram as a function of J3 over J1 and uh, Kitaev over J1, is that there's uh, between the ferromagnetic and the zigzag phase, there is this window that opens up uh, where there, there might be some kind of a Dirac spin liquid phase, according to their um, Parton uh, theory that they also uh, promote. And it turns out that barium cobalt ox arsenic oxide actually lies right in this regime here. Mm -hmm. So uh, th this, is, this is quite interesting. And they also proceed to calculate the, uh, the terahertz response um, for the parameters that are relevant to the compound and, and find a continuum scattering that's quite uh, quite similar to what was actually observed in the terahertz uh, data of, uh, of Armitage and company. So, um, so let me now conclude and uh, to leave some time for, for questions. We've done an inelastic scattering study of, of, the, uh, of the honeycomb uh, anisotropic um, antiferromagnetic material. Um, both the Kitaev and the J1, J3 model can describe some as aspects of the observed of the physical properties. However, only the J1, J3 easy plane model can account for the incommensurate phase with this gamma to M wave vector. And it's also the only model that can actually account for the uh, coherent modes that we observe in the presence of an applied in-plane magnetic field. And so this reveals the compound to actually be an easy plane ferromagnet with, with, uh, with a significant third neighbor antiferromagnetic interaction that, that actually drives it very close to a critical point separate or critical uh, or transition, if you will, between ferromagnetic and modulated phase where there may in fact be some kind of a spin liquid physics uh, present. Um, and uh, so, so uh, there may still be life in this compound, uh, but we think not as a Kitaev compound, but rather as a material with competing um, in-plane interactions. So with that, thank you for your attention. and look yeah, Thank you, Colin, for a very, very nice talk, yeah. So, Sasha. You, you're muted, Sasha. Yeah, uh, thank you, Colin, for a very nice talk. I'm, uh, I'm afraid I have uh, too many theoretical questions for your uh, later <laughs> part of the presentation, but uh, let, me, let me ask an experimental one first. So, so you have uh, you, you, the, the data you have shown are consistently for one field direction, so starting from zero field and then going in the, I, I believe it's, uh, uh, it's uh, what, what do you call the A direction or a star direction? Is it I perpendicular to? B, the B direction because it's- The B direction. Mm -hmm. like a technical because we have to be perpendicular to A star. Mm -hmm. Right, so is, uh, is there some reason or do you have data for the perpendicular direction to that? Uh, we do have data for the for the field along the C direction as well. No, 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 not along the C. Just uh, so this one is perpendicular to the to the nearest neighbor bond, and so I, uh, I'm asking if you have data in elastic neutron scattering data for the field in the along the bond. No, I don't, and but that we could easily do actually. 
Okay. Okay. So, so you, th there was no reason why you didn't do that, or the, the reason basically is it's the, the reason basically is that uh, uh, that the scattering plane typically is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and we wanted in the scattering plane to have access to the incommensurate wave vector. Okay. Okay, then I got. We basically, have to put the field along the b-axis, but in fact, we don't need to have access to the incommensurate wave vector. Because right, because it's not vanishing at the <laughs> the critical field. It's not the one which is vanishing. That's right. Right. So maybe slowly moving to the theoretical questions. Uh, so there is another set of parameters which I'm sure you're aware of, which came, I think, uh, before your paper, and I think it's from the from one of the authors is present in the audience. Uh, I I've been only superficially paying attention to this, but I've noticed uh, their paper. It's also J1, J3, but with different uh, twist to it. I think it's more anisotropic in the, in the J3 term. Do you have any comments on that? Have you tried to use it or? I, I don't have, um, I, I'm aware of this paper, but uh, we probably should have, uh, we, we don't, we, it probably would be interesting to do the calculation with those parameters, which we haven't done. Mm -hmm. It brings me to the first theoretical question. So the phase diagram you showed, how were they obtained? Is it lighter oh, that, that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, that is probably something that uh, we should have, um, that uh, Youngbeck should, should describe, but they were obtained by a variety of different uh, methods. I think it was both some Monte Carlo work, but also some, I think there was also some uh, molecular dynamics work, but I think it was mostly Monte Carlo actually. But it's classical Monte Carlo. Um, I think I think most of it is classical work actually. Right. So so it's it just, as in the case of other calculations, aside for the ones which are in the high field, when you do have reliability yeah. of, uh, of uh, Linear spin wave theory. Uh, you should be very careful with the uh, with the classical calculation. So that's that's I think the lesson of the recent years in this, uh, and because the J J one J three model has been studied before, and uh, you may know that uh, the work by Louis Pierre was uh, inspired by uh, theoretical work, or at least came at the same time as uh, some theoretical work was predicted in a spiral. And this original material, this material originally wasn't seen as the having a zigzag or double zigzag phase, which I think is a conclusion of the, this Helion paper you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, but rather some some kind of uh, some kind of this uh, incommensurate spiral in agreement with that classical work, mm -hmm. which if you take it to the quantum limit is not there. Okay. Yeah. So the the last one is actually the comment on on that is uh, in the context of the work you mentioned of Arun, with whom I spent uh, about a couple of weeks at uh, KATP meeting and we discussed thoroughly our disagreements on this. Uh, so I think he agrees now that it's uh, it's uh, it's actually the spin liquid region is rather contested and uh, we have a recent paper with Steve White and uh, Steve White student uh, Sheng Tao Jiang. Uh, and uh, the, our conclusion is it's actually this IZ phase where the the nail state, which points out of the plane, the spins uh, basically prefer to tilt out of the plane out of frustration. So you think that there actually is an ordered state in between? Yes, it is. A, it is an ordered state. There are no there, there are no spin liquids in between. Okay. But it's actually it's also you know the one, one thing is that it it. From my reading of the paper, maybe coming back to this uh, Louis Pierre's uh, recent uh, reincarnation of uh, Helion paper, I think my reading of it was that they, in the ground state, they did conclude that it's a double zigzag. It's not uh, an incommensurate phase. Double zigzag. Double zigzag. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it could still be incommensurate, no? Double zigzag is a commensurate phase. It's just uh, you know you 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 imagine the uh, oh. honeycomb. So it's but a four sub it's a four, it's a four sub lattice structure. But I think the wave vector really is. Uh, are you saying that becomes a rational fraction? I mean, because the wave vector is some some number that's uh, you know. Uh, Again, maybe maybe both of us should reread this paper, but. <laughs> uh, uh, but again, my my latest reading of it, which wasn't uh, yesterday, 
uh, was that the there was an evolution of the point of view since 1990, which you, you which you cite in this in, in this slide, uh, to that Helion paper, and it actually concluded in uh, in the fact that it's actually a, 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 a commensurate paper. Yeah, but but what we found here actually we we still have this this wave vector seems to be still the same. I, I mean that... okay, yeah. So so I again. Yeah, I mean but, the measurement uh, the measurement are correct. I mean it's it's in common through. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Right. Any other okay. questions? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll I have one small one, but let let me leave it to someone else to ask. Any other question for Colin? Yeah, William. Uh, hi, hi, Colin. Uh. I I have a question about uh, uh uh have you measured the uh, uh crystal field level? No, uh. So you're thinking about really fairly high energy excitations associated. Uh, with... I think for for this uh cobalt compound, it should be around the uh, uh twenty to thirty MeV. Yeah, this we haven't actually looked there. Um. Uh. So that that is. That is worth doing as well. I think that would be very interesting to do. Yeah, yeah, we haven't. Yeah, done. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, how how can you make sure that you can uh, do uh, do the spin wave separately? Uh, if if they are very close, you may need to fit them simultaneously. I think. Yeah, that that's that's a good point. I mean, we we've, we've we have specifically worked with the uh, like a spin orbital. Uh, Kramer's doublet, and in principle, yeah, no, you're right. You know, we, we, it would be good to take that mode into account, um, and uh, that that yeah, that's right. We haven't done it. Okay, that's worth. Okay, yeah. Well, we we uh, we we exceeded time, but that you know specifies the interest of uh, you know people on Colin's work. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Colin. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much. Bye bye.